Well, I thank you all for being here, and I thank Sandy for asking me and organizing this, and I thank Ms. Bentley and Ms. McPherson uh, for their generosity that made this particular conference possible. This is a wonderful uh, combination of events that brought us here, and uh, it is my great pleasure to be here, and I thank you all uh, for being here with me. Okay, um, my subject is a more general one because the circus mascots, which is so familiar, um, and you've seen pictures of it, and there's a nice one for you to look at for a while. Um, the Oval Stadium in the Imperial Period that had at least 150,000, perhaps as many as 250,000 seats, people sitting in it. And Romans uh, watched dramatic and sometimes fatal chariot races. Um, and it's an image that is, uh, I think we all share. If you say circus, the ancient circus, that's what we think of. It's not just because of Ben-Hur. Um, chariot races, accidents, violence, huge roaring crowds, the bread and circuses of the poet Juvenal's satire. Um, he said, the Roman plebs used to be so powerful, now they are satisfied with bread and circuses. And they weren't just horses that raced, they raced, as Sandra showed you. Um, they raced lots of things, elephants, um, mules. Uh, they had foot races as well. Anything that could run, they would race. <laughs> they also had plays and mimes and very, various other kinds of theatricals, though I still wonder how they had a play in the circus. It's one of my great unanswered questions because we know they did. Um, and so how? However, I am going to talk a bit about performances, dramatic performances, as well as others in <coughs> the circus. Modern scholarship has analyzed the circus's entertainment as a way of distracting the city mobs, substituting controlled violence for the uncontrolled violence of public life, um, and as a way of satisfying people's need to be together in a world where, uh, if my colleague Glenn's story is correct, there were only 400,000 people in Rome, uh, but most people do believe there were upwards of a million people. And if you can imagine a city without any kind of electricity, any kind of public services like police, fire, or anything like that, there were, there were brigades of fire people who would come and help you put out a fire. But um, a million people is a lot for a, a pre-modern city. But there were a lot of them, and there's a lot of violence. There are no police in effect, which means that the, um, the thugs and thieves and other people uh, are running rampant, and it is a lot of violence in life. So it's a way of formalizing it, of controlling it, of letting people enjoy it, and yet keeping them safe. I want to introduce you to another side, and it is, in fact, to the background, how the circus became that way. It didn't start as entertainment at all. That is not what the circus is. There were several circuses in Rome, but there's only one circus, and it is the Circus Maximus. And that is what I am talking about today. In origin, it probably dates as a structure from the 6th century BCE that is, during the end of the period of the kings, before the Republic. Much of what is, we would call the icon icon iconographic uh, presentation of the circus, probably is only from the imperial period. We don't really have much of an idea of what it looked like before Augustus, before the Caesars. But there was something there. There were seats there from the 6th century and various shrines. Um, except that quite a few meters of earth cover it. This is the Circus Maximus today. And what you see is two slopes on either, one on either side. This is the Aventine and, the, I'm sorry, this is the Palatine, that is the Aventine. And there's a tree in the center, which is where the center of the Circus Maximus was, and we were talking in lunch, at lunch, and people said, I, I went to Rome and I never saw it. Well, this is why. If you go onto the Palatine, you almost certainly did see it. You looked down on it. And the first time I went there, I said to a friend, what, what's that? 
And she said, well, it's the Circus Maximus. And it just looks like, you know, a place that they didn't build over. It was very much deeper at that time. Uh, originally, many, many meters deeper. Uh, it's so deep that the original structure cannot be excavated because it's covered, it's, it's below the water table and they can't drain it. They would have to, it's so expensive to pump the water out. And this is particularly relevant to what I am going to talk about today. Um, you will see, even today, there's a track around this. This is one person you can see jogging. People come down there with their dog and they run around the circus and it's just a kind of dirt gravel path. When the circus started, that was pretty much what it was. A couple of grassy slopes, uh, natural grassy slopes, and uh, there's gravel just at the bottom of the slopes, natural gravel. So in most of the year, it would have been pretty dry, good way, good place to walk, to have a little path. And this has became the track of the early circus. Now, down the center, there was a brook, which is natural because um, right what you see the center there. Let me see if I can get this here. Yes, the map. The Aventine and the Palatine up here. If you know geography at all, you know if you have two hills and a low place between them, the rain is going to run down and go down the valley and of course it drains into the Tiber. So there was a brook there and there were springs at the top of the hills um, and that brook went down the middle. We will come back to that brook in a moment. But there's a lot of water in Rome. And there are a lot of springs. There's the Tiber. And any time the water is high in the Tiber, you can bet that any of the brooks that led into it would have been high too. So those gravel paths, being gravel, would have been safer places to walk and run and whatever than the middle where it would have been all muddy and dangerous. Now Ovid said that in his day the circus was the place to go to see and to be seen. It's where you picked up women and he has a, a long section where he illustrates just exactly how a gentleman should go about picking up a woman at the circus. <laughs> it is self-evidently a place of performance. You can see that um, let's see if I can go back at this point. Well, it doesn't matter. That'll do. Um, you can see that you have the two slopes. You have the middle. People can sit there and watch, and of course it's a place of performance. You can watch people on either side and down in the middle. So what my argument today is presenting to you, the circus is a place of religious performance a place where religion happened, and it happened in a way that it was meant to be seen. Now, nearby to the circus, and this is important for ancient Rome, because sixth century is still pretty early for Rome, you have, there's the Lupercal, the place where Romulus and Remus were suckled by the wolf. Mm -hmm. There was the Ficus Ruminalis, which was really nearby. That's the fig tree that the basket they were in was finally washed up. And the way the story is told, it's clear that the shepherds brought the twins down somewhere around here when it was, the Tiber was flooding. And then the Tiber receded, and the twins, instead of drowning, washed up right there. Um, there is the Forum Boarium, which is where Hercules, it, he wasn't Hercules for the Romans originally, he was a local monster slayer. And his monster, had his cave, another cave here. The monster was called Cacus. And that was a very famous spot there. Circus Maximus, and this, the, the letters here are just about where the spina would be. At this end, which is the meta that they turned at, was an altar to the god Consus, whom I'm sure you haven't heard of. Um, and no reason why you should have, because I would say most Roman historians and even historians of religion have never heard of Consus. Nevertheless, he was very, very important. And it is significant that his altar was at the, the Meta, 
at the turning point. It was an underground altar. Now, it was also in or beside the brook. Kansas is a very interesting deity because he is liminal. That is, he exists crossing borders. So he has a border between land and water, and water is very important in the circus. He has a border between the underworld and the upper world. And he has a border, as we will see, between the inside and the outside of Rome. Now, there is something else significant about the placement of the circus and the way it is built. In the 6th century, um, the Etruscans, well, some of the kings were Etruscans. Two of them were certainly, and probably the third. But uh, they were legitimate kings in Rome. It wasn't conquest. They had been made kings in a legitimate way by a natural process at Rome. Um, and Rome was very ambitious. Of all the cities in Latium, it regarded itself as the leading city, the caput, the head of all the Latin cities. And across the Tiber is Etruria, and on Rome's side is all the Latin. Um, another thing about Rome at this period that it's very important to know is that this ford right here, uh, there's an island in the middle. It's the only ford of the Tiber between the sea and the mountains. And Etruria had metal. It had copper, a little bit of tin, and iron. And if you want either to cook or you want to make some weapons, you had better have that metal. There are also no harbors, uh, natural harbors, in central Italy. You have to go to southern Italy to Naples uh, to get a good harbor. So you can't ship the metals by sea, easily. Everything had to come across that ford. And you can imagine how wealthy and powerful that made the Romans feel, because of course they charged people to come across their ford. The other thing is, as at, the, at Ostia, which many of you might know, which is at the, the mouth of the Tiber, uh, there were salt beds. And Cato uh, estimates that every, if you have a farm, you must bring in 11 pounds of salt a year per person. And that means taking care of all the animals, and it is the salt you will need to preserve, because it's the only preservative they had. Um, it's the salt you need in order to live. Controlling the salt beds um, was an extremely uh, important and lucrative um, matter for Rome. And the oldest road leading out of Rome towards the mountains is the Via Salaria, the salt road because it's how the salt went up to, um, to the mountains. So the Romans had a, a very strategic position here. And their strategic position clearly led them to believe that strategically they were the most important in Latium. As a result, they built a temple, which is positioned here. Um, these are kind of guesses about this. We, don't, we have the. Um, the substructure has been excavated, but you have to go underneath buildings in order to see it. Um, the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus was built at the same time, in, in the same century. And it is part of Rome's attempt to claim that it was the, cop the head of Rome. That's partly what the Capitoline means. It's the, uh, the head um, of, it, it reflects their idea that they're the head of everything. They also found a head uh, buried there uh, when, they, when they started building the temple foundation. So everything said to them, we are the head of Rome. Now, and that's the, um, the temple. Let me see if I can get back just a bit. Previous. Previous, yes, thank you. Yes, here we go. Now... Where we're standing just behind us is the capital line where the Temple of Jupiter is. <laughs> Here is the peak on which Jupiter of the Latins is worshipped. All the Latin peoples came to that spot at the top of that peak, now known as Monte Cavo, on one, one day in September. And they had a huge festival, extremely important to all of them, 
uh, where they made sacrifices and uh, collectively worshipped Jupiter. And then at night, they set a huge bonfire. And if you look at that tree, is on the spina of the circus. So, and I'm standing, when I took this picture, just slightly to the right. If you look at that, you're looking straight at that peak. So the circus is set certainly, in one sense, not just to see what's below you in the middle, but looking up on September, I think it's 21st, um, towards the Latin, the peak of the, uh, the place where Jupiter of all the Latins was worshipped. But at the other end of this circus, okay, that's looking this way, towards the peak of Jupiter of all the Latins, and up here is Jupiter of the Romans, Jupiter the best and the greatest. And this is a model of what his temple would have looked like. Now, um, in my time at Rome, I finally decided that, yes, it did have a sight line into the circus. And it's a very interesting orientation um, in itself, because it's not towards the Forum, which most people think it is. It is towards, and it's not towards the Forum Boarium either, the cattle market. It is towards the circus. And if you look at the peak, there was a huge statue of Jupiter driving a quadriga, a four-horse chariot, leaping off the roof pole, the ridge pole of the temple. And while I can't prove it, of course, um, given that there isn't anything left, um, it does seem to me that there is at least a suggestion that the flight plan, as it were, of Jupiter, the best and the greatest, the caput of Rome, was taking off to the peak of Jupiter of all the Latins. And indeed, within a century and a half, Rome had conquered all the Latins and had taken over leadership which had previously been shared, of the festival of Jupiter of the Latins. Now, we know that Romans were very careful about the orientation of their temples. And as I say, I can't prove it, but I do think part of the message that this temple is sending is that down the valley of the circus, Jupiter in his quadriga is going to race towards the Jupiter of the Latins. They're one and the same, except that, of course, the Roman one is, as we say, the best and the greatest. And that was a message that was being sent to everyone else. And the Romans were not shy about it. So the circus then stands, as it were, as also as a religious road, if you like, or a religious pathway. It's a very valuable piece of property, even in early Rome. And it's very interesting that it was preserved as a place of performance rather than being you know, sold off to the highest bidder and then um, little bits of it used for religious period, for religious uh, reasons. OK, in the archaic period, that is the period when this is built, the gods are still dynamic beings. They sweep through the Empyrean at will to visit their favorite temples, to receive offerings, and to officiate at ceremonies. And ah, here you can see again the, this is, this is I'm sure many of you have seen the, the um, Apollo from Veii. This is another ridgepole statue. Apollo was striding along the ridgepole of his temple. This is, I think, a representation of how people saw the gods then. The gods came and landed on the temple, and they strode down, and then they came and they had their feast with the people, and then they went off to the next temple. They were honored guests. They were divine patrons, and everybody perceived them to be physical presences somehow in the real human world. The gods coexisted in the human realm in some exhilarating way, particularly on days where there was a festival in their honor. And just like people, they liked good religious spectacle. 
they like to have to share the feast. They like to see the fun. They like to see all the pageantry. And so in Rome, the gods were regularly included in festivals. Now, there were many festivals held in the circus. Um, many festivals held in the circus. The one that I'm going to talk about is the Consuelia, which is the festival to this god, Consus, and it was celebrated on August 21st. We have a description of the procession. The parade began surely at dawn, and it was a parade too, up at the temple of Jupiter Maximus on the Capitoline. The participants moved down the Capitoline, down the Clevis Capitolinus, which is crossways down a slope, down the front of the Capitoline on the forum side, down the Velabrum, which is the area between the Capitoline and the Circus Valley, and into the circus. First came the contestants for the races, the horseback riders, the charioteers, the racers, the foot racers, everybody who was competing, the horseback riders, then representatives of the Roman cavalry, then clowns and jugglers, sorry, then the infantry, then the clowns and jugglers, then the priests, particularly the dancing priests. There were the elder dancing priests, the older men, there were the younger dancing priests, the younger men, and there were the women dancing priests. And probably dancing, it was a war dance. Um, if you, well, if you think about all the movies you've seen of Indians, and American, Native American Indians dancing, that's what we're talking about. We are talking about serious war dances. And one of the great moments, which is preserved in, um, not in Sallust, in Appius, um, the defeat of Carthage by Scipio Africanus, um, he met with his ally, uh, Massinissa, after the defeat of Carthage. Massinissa was an African king who had co contributed the cavalry. And in front of their assembled armies, which numbered in the many thousands, many, many thousands, they each performed their national war dances. This was the conclusion in 2004 of the war against Carthage. These war dances are extremely important. So the dancing priests were performing a war dance as they come down. Okay, behind them, there are the magistrates of the city, all dressed in their togas and their headdresses. And behind them, dozens of gods, their statues on pillows, carried along, and then Jupiter last of all. And they all came down the capital line, down the Clevis Capitolinus, and entered the circus. Now, the gods, of course, had their own seating. We think this is called the pulvinar, which means the, the place with pillows. Um, so they had their pillows here. The emperor eventually sat there, too. They were spectators here, too. The gods were always in the circus. They were present. And they were understood to be present, too. Now, the earliest structures did probably were seating, and they were probably seating for the most important people among whom were the gods. At this time, in this early time, religion, Roman religion, was about the relationship between the gods and the city of Rome. What other people, other gods, did or thought or how they interacted, whether Jupiter went off to Athens or Olympia or not, was not a concern to the Romans. I mean, it just, it wasn't a concern. What they were interested in was their relationship to these gods and what the gods thought of them. These were divine patrons. And just exactly as today, you want your patron to enjoy him or herself, you want them to feel part of the community, and you want to show them the best that you have and let them uh, share in the best that you have. And this is what these festivals were about when they start. Okay, this is the, this is the beginning. It is a matter of sharing the community's wealth and power with the gods and in the gods' presence. And then, of course, the entire city is gathered as well. 
Now, at this point, I'm going to talk to you about the ritual at the Consuelia, at this festival for the god Consus. Now, it is, as I said, his altar is underground on the water here at the turning point of the circus. And the ritual goes back, it has a, a drama, and it was performed. And the ritual time of the drama, that is the dramatic time, is the early city when Romulus was first king. At that time, Rome was entirely made up of Romulus's followers, all men, escaped slaves, runaway criminals, and the general loose change of archaic Italy. And that's how the Romans tell it. The first men of the city needed women or the city would die with them. And I think you all know the story of how they got women. Um, and if you don't, you can always go see the movie Seven, uh, Seven Wives for Seven Brothers. <laughs> and uh, it is the story of Romulus. The same, it is this story, just told differently. Okay, um, that's the Sabine women. So briefly, Romulus wanted brides for his men from neighboring communities like the Sabines, and he was rebuffed without exception. They would not recognize a city of thieves and outlaws, which recognition was the prerequisite for allowing contracts of marriage. In the meantime, there was continual skirmishing, or perhaps better cattle raiding, between the communities. But the Sabines continued to refuse to establish a treaty that would allow peaceful relationships between them and the new Roman city. On the advice of the god Consus, who was the king's advisor, Romulus developed a ploy a ruse to achieve his ends. He announced a festival in honor of Consus, which would have races and theatrical performances to which the Sabines were invited. A truce was made on this basis, and that is, a truce is made between the Sabines and the Romans, just a truce. And the Sabines, with their wives and daughters, showed up and were seated on the slope of the Palatine, that is the far side where the Pulvinar is, to watch the proceedings. The altar of Consus was in the valley at the turning point. What the Sabines did not know, and what few if any scholars today seem to have recognized, is that the ruse played on the Sabines' refusal to establish, pre uh, rec is the ruse that played, this, played on the Sabines. Because this was the brook, what was, became the spina, and that's why it's always water. They preserved the brook even when they bridged it over. And that was the sacred boundary of Rome, the Pomerium. We don't know where the rest of the Pomerium was, but we do know it went straight down the circus and turned at Consus's altar. The sacred boundary is different from the physical boundary because the walls of the city were up on the Palatine. So the Sabines came in. And they looked, and the truce applies only to neutral territory. That is, territory not controlled by either one of them. Because you can't make a truce with a city you don't recognize. I mean, right? The, the city itself doesn't exist. They've just agreed not to fight in between. So by the Sabines' perception, they're still in neutral territory when they sit down on the side of the Palatine, because the city walls are up behind them. Little did they know that they had just crossed the boundary and they were in the city they had refused to recognize, which meant they had no rights. They had walked, it's just as if you walk into, um, well, if you want to say it this way, gangland territory, right? Um, there you are. And there they were. So the Romans did what was planned which was as soon as things started and the Sabines were all settled, they leapt out, they grabbed the women, and the Sabines, men, ran away. Now, this is again the confession that they knew that they were wrong. And so those were the first women of Rome. The first men had their first women. And the Romans did not violate the truce. The trick was precisely the sort of thing that archaic communities loved to hear about. It is not unlike the trick of the Trojan horse, in which an object is represented as being a gift to the gods, a sacred object, 
so that the Trojans will take it in their city, even though far from being a gift to the, their goddess and a protective um, sacred object, it was a means of the destruction of the city um, that the gods were supposed to be protecting. This is archaic morality. You have a warrior, the warrior figures out a trick, and it's good stuff, right? And everybody cheers and is happy. Uh, it was archaic warrior behavior. And this trick, which gave Rome a future, was specifically tied to the god Consus and to the Circus Valley where his altar was located. Every year at the Consualia in August, this story was enacted by the priests and the Vestal Virgins before the assembled gods and the people of Rome. It is all but certain that the Flamen Quirinalis, the major priest who represented uh, the deified Romulus, performed as Romulus. The other priests performed as the Roman men, and the Vestals, of course, performed as the Sabine women. Sacred dramas are very familiar in archaic religion. The performance would have been highly stylized. If there were speaking parts, they would have been limited, but there was some kind of narrative um, which fixed the story. In all our sources, the story of the Sabine women does not vary, even though the Romans themselves, after the fifth century, really disapproved of it. Um, they, they were very embarrassed by it, and, and Cicero just calls it you know, that primitive ritual. Um, it's, they don't like it, but it's there, and everyone knows it. Now, there's a, a lot to be said about all of this and what it means for the vessels and everything else, but I want to go on to the further part of the story. Eventually, the Sabine men return, armed and ready to take back their women. Now, as the narrative tells us, remember, this is, this is ritual drama. It doesn't have time, as we understand it, built into it. It is the Sabine women were taken, the men come back, and by then the Sabine women are married and they have children. And so the Sabine men come in, but the women are appalled. And when the two sides start fighting, the women run out, and they run between the armies, and they beg their husbands on the one hand and their brothers and their fathers on the other to make peace. And so they do. And the tradition goes, not only did they make peace, but the Romans invited the Sabine king, Titus Tatius, to share the throne with Romulus, and they invited the Sabines to come into the city. Now, I want to emphasize this because it is the basis for the Roman understanding of who Romans are. They saw this every year at the beginning of the festival. It is performed. And as a performance, it says, we, as people, are saved by women who can make peace for us and who bring in other communities to our city. Romans are unusual historically in their willingness to take in other cities, to extend citizenship. Um, citizenship is understood as something that can be extended. It's not connected to blood or birth, in essence. And this is, this is very unusual. And they continue to see it as a way of strengthening the state. Uh, it's also a way of you know, extending power, but we, we will look at it from the religious point of view at this point. It is a way of ensuring the future wealth and power of the city by giving it a community that is vital and strong and peaceful. And it turns on the behavior of women. Now, it was definitely performed in the circus, and the first women were represented by the Vestals. And therefore, the Vestals, who are extremely important in Roman religion and in Roman society, continue to represent women whose power resides in part in their ability to settle disputes, to act on behalf of the city in a peaceful way, bringing resolution that does not involve war. And it defines the character of the people. It religiously defines the character of people. And it gives them a point of anxiety, our enemies. And it defines how that anxiety is going to be resolved. You confront it, the women come out, and they rescue the city, and the city is larger, greater, and stronger as a result. The core of it is the city is weak, the city is attacked, the women produce a means of resolving that. 
Now there's a second ritual that I want to go into, which is uh, performed at another consuelia in July. And it's very much related. In fact, everybody knows it's a, uh, a mirror image of the Sabine women. Okay, again, we are in a conflict. This time, King Romulus is dead. He just died. And the Sabines hear about it, and so they rush over with their army. And they say, give us some women. And the Roman men are absolutely paralyzed by the loss of the only king they've ever known. And they don't know what to do. They really don't know what to do. And this is how the ritual is told. They don't know what to do. A woman comes out by the name of Tutela, and that means guardian. It's a regular epithet of goddesses. Uh, Tutela says to the magistrates, I have a ruse. And the magistrates agree to it. And so, and this, we know this was performed. There is a pretend funeral. In mourning, the Romans come out of the city, and certain women, dressed as married women, led by Tutela, come out with them. The funeral procession is for these women, for they are being handed over to the Sabine men as though going to their death. The Romans then retreat to the safety of their walls. The women tell the Sabines that their victory is on the day of a festival of Juno Capertina, and they ought to, to celebrate and feast. So the Sabines do that, and the women give them wine, lots of wine. Have another, my dear, have another, and yet another. And finally, the Sabine men are so drunk, they all fall asleep. At night, Tutela takes a torch, climbs up into a fig tree, and where have we heard of a fig tree before? She climbs up into a fig tree, and hiding herself with a toga, she waves the torch, and the Roman men rush out of the city, calling to each other, Lucius Gaius, Lucius Gaius, and they join up with the women, and they attack the Sabines, and they throw the Sabines out, and they have a, their own feast. And they celebrate. Once again, you have a conflict in which the men are powerless to resist. The women devise a ruse by which the enemy is tricked. And together, the men and women rout the enemy and have a celebration. Now, these are very archaic rituals. And you would think they might not have survived, but we know that they did. And the reason I think they did is because they're performed. And we know that in the 490s, sorry, 390s uh, BCE, the Gauls attacked, attacked Rome and actually did succeed. Um, they came in, they looted, they did a little bit of destruction. The Roman Senate bought them off with some gold and they went away. But Rome had been safe within her walls for centuries. The whole, the fact that it happened was far more important than what they lost. And this whole story was retold. In fact, in our sources, it's told about the Gallic sack as a secondary performance after the death of Romulus. It is still a vital festival that talks about how Romans face adversity. And I would argue, um, it's a complicated argument, but it was performed in the circus as well. First, it's where the Sabine women are performed, and it is such a replica of the Sabine women. Secondly, it's the Vestals. Um, thirdly, the Carcares, the two towers there were called the Opida, and that is the word for cities, towns really. And if you talk about men bursting through the gates of the town and you're thinking, where's the gate here? I think those were the gates. They're, they're ritual gates, right? We're not talking about official gates. We're talking about performance gates. And I think that this is where it was. And again, it was for the assembled city to watch with the gods. Now, after this, these performances, we know that there were actual theatrical performances, plays put on. And as I say, it's very interesting to think of how this was done. There are plays that we have that reflect the same story told about different historical periods. The story of Lucretia, which you've probably heard of, Cloelia, which you probably haven't, uh, Virginia, um, and the wonderful Claudia Quinta, much later um, in, in the Hannibalic War, all reflect exactly the same pattern. The men are helpless. There is a conflict 
a woman steps out and she does something that resolves the problem and saves the city. Each one of those was a drama, we're pretty certain, and I suspect they were performed. They were among the dramas that were performed here, not the only ones. So there were dramas, and then there were the races, but they were not entertainment originally. Originally, these are the races that young men perform because they're part of the military, and it's the part of their military training. So you have the foot races for the infantry, and you have the horse races for the cavalry. They may even have had chariot races, though they did not fight with chariots. Um, then they had what are called the Ludi Troi, Ludi Troi, um, which are the games of Troy. Now the games of Troy were a complex set of cavalry maneuvers um, that were, well, if you think of Spanish riding school, that's what they were. Um, Training a horse to fight is very hard. It is a very complex pro uh, process, and the horse must be trained to meet all kinds of things, uh, leaping over dead bodies, rearing up and attacking bodies in front of it that are wielding swords and spears, um, turning, maneuvering, twisting. All these things have to be trained. And the Ludi, Ludi Troi were a point where the cavalry performed all these tricks. Now, if you think about not only Spanish riding school, but the modern equivalent, the Blue Angels, you'll see what I mean. On the website of the Blue Angels, they say, a Blue Angels flight demonstration exhibits choreographed refinements of skills possessed by all naval aviators. That's exactly what <coughs> these kinds of games were at all levels. They are displays of skill and chances for the men to show how strong they were and to train together in front of the whole city and the gods. So how did the circus then become the place that we've been talking about today? The place where it's entertainment, where there are um, slaves, uh, charioteers, and you have all these, um, uh, all these teams. Well, about the third century, the Roman cavalry was hired out to the uh, Italians and the Gauls and, and the Africans. And in the second century, the Roman legions ceased to be the small landholders and it was mostly hired out to the landless men of Italy. And after that, you have professional armies and you have no need for professional, for your military to train in these games, what you have is a need for professionals to take up the space. And this is how I think the circus becomes the professional display of simple racing that we know of it today. So I would suggest that by the end of the imperial, well, the middle, let's say second century is when we're talking about, um, we still have these festivals being performed. Uh, we still have the ritual dramas going on. We still have the Vestals doing their performance, but then we have all the races. People still knew those stories. They went on even after they were banned by the Christians, because we have St. Augustine who says, after a new set of Gauls sacked Rome in August of um, 410, the Romans run right back to the circus, he says. This is why. This is where they, as Romans, find their protection and renew it. And 40 years later, Pope Leo says they should be going to Christian ceremonies, not back to these old games and circuses. It took another century to actually destroy the circus as a place where Romans learned about what it is to be Roman. And I have one last <laughs> New charioteers. Thank you very much.